Hello and welcome to video lecture in sociology. Today we are going to discuss chapter 5 titled as Change in Development in Industrial Society from the textbook Social Change in Development in India. This chapter is divided into four parts. So far we have discussed about nature, features and emergence of industrial societies, industrial revolution and industrialization in India, how people find jobs or employment and we have also discussed about bureaucracy. Today we will discuss about the issues pertaining to or problems related to working conditions and some things about trade unions. Industrialization led to mechanization which means it changed the way things were produced traditionally. It also changed the way work was organized. It would be interesting to explore how work actually takes place. How are the products that we see around and consume are manufactured? What is the nature of relationship between managers and workers in the factory or in the office? In this lecture, we will explore some of these issues. With the establishment of factories, the personal and informal relations of traditional society were replaced by formal and impersonal relations between workers and owners and managers of the business. The basic task of a manager is to control workers and get more work out of them. In the process, the capitalist employs various techniques to improve efficiency and productivity of his workforce and earn as much profit as he can. There are two main ways in which workers' productivity can be increased. One is to extend the working hours themselves. The other is to increase the amount that is produced within a given period of time. One of the first attempts to increase workers' output in the factories is popularly known as scientific management, proposed by Frederick Winslow Taylor. Around early 20th century, Frederick Winslow Taylor developed certain scientific principles to improve productivity and efficiency of workers. Simply stating, scientific management is application of science to management. Prior to scientific management, production and work methods were determined by individual workers or mechanics based on their personal experience, preference and whatever tools were available for the work. Frederick Winslow Taylor was a mechanical engineer. He sought to improve industrial efficiency through use of scientific techniques. Taylor developed new tool designs, methods and procedures of production to improve productivity of labor. In scientific management, the work was broken down into small repetitive elements and it was divided between workers. Workers were timed with the help of stopwatches and had to fulfill a certain target every day. Taylor established targets for production and a corresponding system of rewards for meeting the goals. He also developed criteria for scientific selection and training of workers, which means to choose the best worker or skill according to the need of the job. Skill and experience of worker must match the requirement of the job. Scientific management improved productivity of labor immensely. Production was further speeded up by the introduction of assembly line by Henry Ford in Ford Motors in early 20th century. Assembly line is an arrangement of workers, machines and equipment in such a way that a product is assembled part by part as it moves on a conveyor belt in a sequence continuously from start to finish. It is also called as production line. The speed of the work could be easily set by adjust adjusting the speed of the conveyor belt. In an assembly line production is divided into small steps and each task is assigned to an individual worker. The worker becomes highly proficient at performing the single task at the same place. Workers must be able to complete their task within a specific time and the time is determined by the speed of the conveyor belt on which the product moves. Scientific management and assembly line resulted in improving efficiency of labor and overall productivity in the industry. However, both these techniques of production were severely criticized. Why? Because breaking down and simplification of task led to rise of boredom and alienation among workers and many of them started absenting themselves from the work. The separation of planning and doing also led to dissatisfaction among workers as they did not see themselves as part of production planning or at any step involved in the process of production other than just executing the task given to them. Workers were simply doing the task given to them that was monotonous or routine work. The design and allocation of work specifying not only what is to be done but also how it is to be done and the exact time within which it is to be done left no scope for the individual creativity and involvement with the work process. 
This detachment led to conflict and rise of antagonistic relations between the workers and the management. Human relations theories criticize scientific management and assembly line for being inflexible and dehumanizing and treating workers as an economic entity working for wages only. In fact, HR theories or human relation theories shifted focus from productivity to the social and psychological needs of the workers. The shift can be explained as that in scientific management and assembly line, the individual was treated as a worker. Whereas in human relations era, the worker was started to be treated as an individual. The shift can be explained as that in scientific management and assembly line, where individual is treated as a worker, in human relations era, the worker was treated as an individual. As you know that machinery helps to increase production but it also creates the danger that eventually machine will replace the workers. Scholars and intellectuals like Karl Marx and Mahatma Gandhi saw mechanization as a great danger to labor and employment. The higher the degree of mechanization of an industry, the lesser is the degree of employment. And the employed too have to work with the pace of the machine. The machine gradually replaces labor and renders large number of people jobless or unemployed. The dehumanizing conditions of work in assembly line can be seen in a major car producing company close to Delhi. In this plant, every minute two cars roll off the assembly line. But workers get only 45 minutes of rest in the entire day. What do these 45 minutes include? They include two tea breaks of seven and a half minutes each and one lunch break of half an hour. The company may pay you good salary but the monotony of the work reduces the involvement and satisfaction of the worker with the work. Most of the workers in these industries get exhausted by the age of 40 and they take voluntary retirement. While production has gone up, the number of permanent jobs in the factory has come down. The firm has also outsourced the manufacturing of various components of the car. The part suppliers are located around the factory and send the parts or the components every two hours or just in time. Although the method of outsourcing or just in time has its own advantages and it cuts the cost for the company, but the workers come under psychological pressure because if the supplies fail to arrive, their production targets get delayed and when they do arrive, they have to run faster to keep up with the target. As a result, they are not just physically but get mentally exhausted as well, which further has health and emotional implications for them. As compared to manufacturing sector, or secondary sector, work in service sector or tertiary sector is supposed to be interesting and creative. People in service sector such as software professionals are well educated. But with its advantages, service sector is no less damaging for the workers. It is as demanding, exhausting and at times even depressing. Long working hours are the central to the service industry's work culture. These professionals work for 10 to 12 hours on an average in a day and may have to work overnight when projects have to be finished within a given period of time. Most of the outsourcing work in India is carried out during night or in the night shifts because of the time gap between India and the US. Moreover, in the outsourced projects, cost and timelines are usually underestimated in terms of man days or man hours required. And because man hours are based on the 8 hour day average, engineers have to put in extra hours and time in order to meet the deadlines. Extended working hours are legitimized by the common management practice of flexi time, which in theory gives the employee freedom to choose his or her working times or working hours within the limits, but which in practice means that they have to work as long as it is necessary to finish the task at hand. The pressure of service sector primarily run by the private companies is typical, that even when there is no real work or deadline to meet, Workers tend to stay late in the office either due to the peer pressure or because they want to show the boss that they are working very hard. These practices are common in places like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune and Gurgaon where many IT firms or call centers are located. Here shops and restaurants have also changed their opening hours and they remain open till late in the night. If both husband and wife work in the tertiary sector, then they have to rely on maid servants to take care of their children. Although such kind of changes bring about a cultural change or transformation in society in terms of giving people more freedom and choice, but such work cultures are not socially healthy. Although it may be perceived that industrialization will lead to rise in the skill level of the society, but according to braver men, rather than increase in the skills, 
there has been a progressive degradation or de-skilling of the work. Scientific management and assembly line have been used by the employers to take control of the labor processes and remove gradually the skills from the workers. You may also think that are all skills comparable like skill of an IT professional about a software and a farmer who knows how to grow different types of crops relying on his understanding of weather, the types of soil and seeds. Though different types of works may not be directly comparable on certain measurable scales, yet work in general requires basic understanding of nature of work, skills to perform that work, commitment and motivation on the part of the worker. And every job or work for whatever type has its specific advantages and disadvantages. Another important aspect related to work is the labor working conditions. The government has passed a number of laws to regulate working conditions. For instance, almost 5.5 lakh workers are employed in coal mines in India. The Mines Act of 1952 regulates workers in mine. But these rules are followed in big companies. And small companies generally evade all these acts and rules mentioned in them. Subcontracting is widespread in this field. Many contractors do not maintain proper register of workers, thus avoiding any responsibility for accidents and benefits occurring. There are problems related to working conditions, particularly in the unorganized sector. Majority of the workers in unorganized sectors are migrants. For instance, the fish processing plants along the coastline employ mostly single young women from Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala. Many of them are housed in small rooms and sometimes one shift has to make way for the another. Young women are seen as submissive workers. They are paid less and exploited more. You can find similar problems in the home-based work also, which is an important part of the economy but is part of unorganized sector like beady rolling industry, agarbatti making, carpet and zari weaving. Here again primarily women are engaged who get work through a contractor and are paid per piece as they make. Workers in the organized sector are part of trade unions. That is an advantage for them. As a pressure group, trade unions attempt to represent interest of the working class. The main objectives of the trade union is to represent workers' interest. They generally negotiate with the management for better wages, working conditions, participation in making decisions pertaining to work, welfare of workers, training and promotion of staff, conditions of service, etc. This is called as the process of collective bargaining. As a pressure tactic, trade unions resort to strikes. Whenever workers feel that their interest is suppressed, they press their demands by strike or stopping the work. In a strike, workers do not go to the work. On the contrary, in a lockout, the management shuts the gate and prevents workers from coming in. In fact, to call a strike is a difficult decision, as managers may try to use substitute labor. Workers too find it hard to sustain without wages and hence do not take decision to go on strike so easily. Other organized forms of action include refusal to carry out certain duties, absenting from work, rejecting or not using any new equipment, etc. In order to restore harmony, decisions regarding the workers' demand are made through negotiation between employer and the leaders and prominent members of the trade union. Strikes are generally considered as a social problem. They are manifestation of industrial unrest and discontent among the workers which is not considered to be socially healthy or good. But some sociologists see strikes as a normal part of industrial relations in a capitalist society. Whatever may be the argument, trade unionism in general is an effective tool in the hands of the working class to put across its problems to the management. At times it is perceived that trade unions representing interest of the working class in India has lacked basic organizational structure and competent functionaries. As a result, they have been ineffective in articulating interest of millions of people constituting working class in India. So these are some of the aspects related to work and working conditions in brief. To conclude, let's summarize this chapter. In this chapter, we have attempted to learn about the change and development in industrial societies. We began our discussion by understanding the features and rise of industrial society and how it is different from pre-industrial societies. We discussed about industrialization in India, various sectors of economy such as primary, secondary and tertiary sector, organized and unorganized sectors. We differentiated between the government sector and the private sector and we also briefly discussed about women in the workforce and gender segregation in employment patterns in various sectors. This chapter also brought in the issue of finding jobs and working conditions. Towards the end, 
we discussed about the articulation of interest of the working class through trade unions. So this is about industrial society in brief. Enjoy reading this chapter. Thank you. Thank you.